And at the outset, I would like to congratulate uh, Bansi and his team for putting up such a wonderful uh, academic feast. And uh, thank you so much for making me a part of this uh, particular symposium. So uh, I shall start by sharing my screen because I think we're running short of time. Yeah. Yes. So the task ahead of me today is to talk about the science of obesity, basically relating to the under, uh, understanding of the underlying factors. Obesity is as ill understood as it is prevalent. So it is still elusive, the pathophysiology and what actually makes people obese. We know a lot of things, but we don't really have a unified kind of hypothesis. And we still, I feel, groping in the dark, but whatever we have, Whatever we know is what I'm going to present to you. So these are my disclosures. I've been commercially supported for this particular talk. The agenda in uh, front of us is uh, obesity as a chronic disease. It has to be recognized as a chronic disease if we are, able, we are going to be able to treat it in a proper manner. And then I'm going to talk a little about what we know about regulation of energy balance and the pathophysiology of obesity. So as I was saying, obesity is already now being recognized as a disease and a global health issue. There are many organizations which have already designated obesity as a chronic disease. The connotation and implication of designating a particular disease as a chronic disease means that uh, it has to be treated lifelong. It may be treated pharmacologically, maybe surgically, and it needs the intervention of healthcare professionals. So all of this is encompassed in the uh, definition that it is a chronic disease. So this is what we know traditionally about obesity, that there are calories in, calories out, there is an imbalance, and hence you have fat storage. But is it really as simple as this? Well, obviously not. Now we know a lot more than just calories in and calories out. Let's talk a little about this in detail and then go to the other factors that complicate the issue for us. So if this is the energy balance equation where intake and expenditure are equal, then the weight is supposed to remain stable and intake is supposed to be governed by things like hunger, satiety, and the absorption of the nutrients, whereas expenditure depends upon the metabolic rate, thermogenesis, structured exercise, and NEAT, that is just non-exercise activity that, is, that we call NEAT. So this is supposed to be the basic traditional energy balance equation. And if you have to go into the details of this a little bit, we know that as far as energy expenditure is concerned, the resting metabolic rate doesn't change much on a day to day basis. So if you have to manipulate anything, it is only this little part that is the physical activity. And this you can dissipate energy through exercise or through NEAT, whereas resting metabolic rate is the one that actually keeps the metabolism going. And that is the energy that the body requires to keep it going in an awake, supine, relaxed state. And also there is the thermic effect of food when food is being digested energy is used up and that is also part of the resting metabolic rate. This is what we know. This is as far as energy expenditure is concerned. This is somewhat easy to understand. Intake of food is not as easy because there is something called appetite regulation. And for appetite regulation, you have several things apart from just hunger. So you look at food, you smell food, you taste food, and you feel happy about it, that is the reward part of it. Then there are emotions which make you eat or not eat. Then there is the social context. You're full, but you go for a party, you want to eat even if you have no appetite. And then the cognition. So all these things are there and there is a complex interplay. I'll go a little more into those details about how different organs are all, it's like a symphony orchestra where everything is working together to make a person eat. So it's not just appetite, hunger, intake. There are many other things to this and there are many organs involved in all of this. And each of these organs is going to produce several hormones. So you can imagine if this is the structure of regulation of appetite, what things can go wrong? There are so many things here that can go wrong at several levels. 
this tells us that there is a very very complex interplay so it's not just simple hunger there are many more things that are important in this and by that i mean that there are several mechanisms so one is that this part of hunger which i just talked about that is you are hungry and you eat you have a hunger hormone and you have satiety hormones in the brain and you eat or you don't eat or you're full so this is simple homeostatic eating and that energy balance equation which i showed you is dependent only on this however that equation doesn't always take into consideration these other parts one is hedonic eating that means you're not hungry but you're eating for the pleasure the taste the context the social setting and that is why this hedonic eating or eating for pleasure often overpowers the homeostatic mechanisms for eating such as dopamine controls the wanting the motivation to eat then you have the opioid and cannabinoid receptors that control liking the pleasure associated with food and we know that we have had certain drugs like rimonabant etc acting somewhere at this level third thing is the executive function the uh, homeostatic uh, mechanisms are there you are hungry uh, you find it very palatable now it's your decision you want to eat or not to eat whether you can actually stop your eating and this is where the behavioral intervention comes that all these factors are in play but i don't want to eat or all these factors are in play and i want to eat so this is homeostatic hedonic and executive components of eating behavior added to all of this is genetics so the genetic predisposition is another dimension in all of these eating behaviors so what happens is when you start to eat food right from the oral cavity to the rectum you have several hormones that come into play that are sending signals to the brain and apart from that when food enters the portal vein these nutrient uh they cause some sensing that is called nutrient sensing so if the glucose fat protein that are acting through the liver muscle beta cell and adipose tissue and also sending signals to the brain and this is the homeostatic mechanism so it's from the gut and from the nutrients and these are all sensed by these organs and the brain decides to start eating or stop eating so this is the complex interplay that i was talking about and in if you have to go into the details of what happens in the brain to stop and start you have stimulatory neurohormones and you have inhibitory neurohormones and these are important to understand when you are understanding the complex interplay of course as i said there is energy in energy out and all of these other organs but these signals then become important to tell you to stop eating or start eating and that is why when so many organs are involved so many signals are involved obviously food intake regulation is complex that's why i said expenditure is easy to understand energy expenditure is easy to understand but food intake is very very complex because added to all of this as i said the decision to eat that is the behavior control is the most important dimension apart from all these hormonal homeostatic hedonic mechanisms so the regulation of body weight in a nutshell is you have homeostatic signals you have the brain and you have these different organs and there is nutrient sensing and all of them regulate the body weight in all of this as i showed you in the nutrient sensing the gut plays a very critical role in regulating energy and glucose homeostasis such as i told you right from the oral cavity all the way down to the rectum you have different hormones which are going to act in concert and sending signals to the brain now apart from all these organic factors you have several other factors which are we call environmental factors for example you have an individual who is obese and you have the society around him so there is an unresolved controversy that revolves around the contribution of personal responsibility of behavior to eat or not to eat versus the other factors for example personal responsibility of eating or not eating actually does not occur in a social vacuum you we are all social animals we live in a world that has got all these environmental factors so is the responsibility completely of that person 
to eat or not to eat independent of what the society is throwing at him the obesogenic environment that we talk about how important is that in all of this mechanism that is what i mean by an individual versus societal factors so the environmental factors that i just talked about are this food abundance this junk food exercise you may have access not have access medications are there then there are infective agents smoking intrauterine environment and epigenetics maternal age lack of sleep all these environmental influences also come into the mix of that for example sedentary activity has increased from 1960 to 2010 in this fashion so you can see here that uh, light activity has increased and moderate activity has come down so exercise levels have come down and sedentariness has increased and consequently the bmis have started to increase for example tv viewing time has increased in children aged 6 to 17 and both boys and girls and you can see here how the bmis have increased because of this sedentary behavior these are environmental factors so these are all the underlying factors of obesity then there is another dimension to it and that is gut microbes they affect the gut permeability and in turn call, cause metabolic inflammation insulin resistance and glucose intolerance and they say that microbial lipopolysaccharide may be involved in initiating these inflammatory responses so dietary fat ingestion is involved in this because it causes a potentially pro inflammatory free fatty acid and facilitates development of metabolic endotoxemia that is what is the connection between gut microbiota and inflammation then there are medications that cause weight gain now why are all these points important because it looks like simple obesity but there are many underlying factors and this has a clinical application because all this is part of clinical history for example you need to know what medications the patient is taking because of which weight gain might be caused like antipsychotics or beta blockers it may be slight contribution but you have to be aware of it we don't have that much data on oral contraceptives then we have uh, some uh, diabetic medications like thiazolidine diuretics which can cause weight gain so one must be very aware of this particular interplay then comes the genetic aspect so there is evidence that genetic factors regulate body weight the evidence that body weight is highly heritable comes from family twin and adoption studies and studies in children in the midst of the obesity epidemic epidemic showed substantial heritability for bmi with only a very modest effect of the shared environment so it cannot be ignored that genetics is involved as you can see over here the difference between monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins and therefore it is said at least in this study that the genetic dice are loaded against those with obesity and in favor of thin people and we have snips that are linked to fat mass and obesity associated gene the fto gene they are associated with the greatest risk of the common obesity what we call so though we call it common obesity now there is evidence to show that there is genetic basis for this and genome wide association studies are there for bmi waist to hip ratio other adiposity traits and they have identified more than 300 snips for this the biology of a person with obesity changes and this predisposes them to further weight gain so it becomes a vicious cycle it's like an obesity begets obesity and what they, the changes that occur in them are that there is impaired gustatory and olfactory sensitivity there is impaired nutrient sensing i showed you a slide about nutrient sensing of glucose fats and carbohydrates and uh, proteins and this sensing itself is impaired uh, from the gut to the brain i showed you that there are signals that go from the gut to the brain and this is all changed then i showed you also about gut microbiome causing inflammation and there is altered gut microbiome and added to that there is leptin and insulin resistance then there is change in the brain structure so altered resting state connectivity in brain regions involved in energy regulation reward and motivation and i have shown you all those connections which happen and which go to the brain and there is enhanced brain response to high energy food cues in the reward region this is the hedonic eating so uh, you eat something that you love and you get Uh, uh, uh you know signaling in the reward region so to sum it up obesity is a complex and multifactorial disease 
So the underlying factors that are there in obesity, which is the subject of my talk, are very, very diverse and variable. So you have energy intake and energy expenditure is too simplistic a hypothesis because added to that, you have your brain, you have all these sensing organs, you have medication, you have genetics, you have everything, and you have a bad obesogenic environment, socioeconomic problems, then there is sleep deprivation. And then, of course, the hedonic inputs are there, palatability of food, taste of food, etc. Therefore, obesity can spread over social networks. Environmental factors set the framework for an individual obesity. Genetic factors are important, as I already showed you. Available food is driving the epidemic. Energy expenditure may play some role. It is a regulated system, but a lot of things can go wrong, as I've already showed you. And gut signals affect feeding and gut microbiome also affects obesity. So in a nutshell, all of these factors, there's a complex interplay of them, which ultimately leads to a person becoming obese and obesity begets more obesity. And we have to keep all these underlying factors in mind when we are going to design therapies for these individuals, which will give long lasting uh, results. And you will see that you will hear more about that in the next two talks about how therapies can be designed for overcoming many of these setbacks, which I have already shown you. So thank you all for your kind attention. I would request the chairperson uh, to take my questions at this point of time, because I have to enter another meeting and may not be able to wait till the end of this session. Thank you.